Okay, so we're talking about Shadow and Bone, a TV show you can find on Netflix. It's marketed for teens, and yet here we are again with lots of occult symbolism, hidden knowledge that most people are not privy to, and yet this stuff is st still working on the subconscious level to uh, program your children. So. What is this show about, really? Well, first of all, it's a show where we see animal, human, either hybrids, or in this case, uh, a magic formula was done to obtain animal powers, which is a common theme, especially if you read the work of Kenneth Grant, who was a protege of Aleister Crowley. Now, there's another show that just came out called Sweet Tooth, and here we are again with uh, human-animal hybrids, in this case children, following a post-apocalyptic virus, believe it or not. Uh, at the same time as the virus, these uh, hybrids started showing up. So let's begin, a lot of this will be more clear once we have a sense of what these animal powers or magical elements that I've been referring to. So this is from Kenneth Grant. He writes, The magical theories which underlie the formula of the assumption of God forms are of vital importance to an understanding of Crowley's later refinement and rehabilitation of the, the masquerading as animal-headed deities. The wearing of pelts, horns, skins, bestial organs, etc. was done with intent to assimilate the superhuman powers possessed by certain animals. This formula, which was used by the sorcerers of the ancient world, had a profound effect upon the psychology of the operator. Because man evolved from beasts, and let me just pause there and say that I think he doesn't mean that in a Darwinian sense, but more of a spiritual Kabbalistic sense, which I wrote about on my blog. So, continuing here, because man evolved from the beasts, he possesses deeply buried in his subconsciousness the memories of superhuman powers he once possessed. Each animal typifies one or more such powers, strength and subtlety of the leopard, seeing or sensing in darkness for the cat, the owl, or the bat. Swift, death-dealing power of the snake, the power of transfer, for transformation for the hyena, and so on. Any required atavism could be evoked by assumption of the appropriate god form. This process was known to initiates as the formula of the divine ape, or the ape of Thoth, the ape being an image of the primal link between man and beast. It was also a symbol of the astral body. Okay, so, we see, and how do we, later on in, in that book, and in his future work, uh, he talks about the Da'ath portal as being sort of this entry gate into these primal atavistic animal powers, which we can all access because we came from that kingdom at some point. We didn't originate with the animals, but we went through the animal kingdom, at least our soul did, during its travels. Alright, so let's focus in on Shadow and Bone, and we'll see a lot of these themes popping up. First of all, you can notice uh, in the title screen we have twin sons, two sons. We have the infinity symbol underneath the word bone, so we're dealing with time. And of course, with the Da'ath portal being outside of time, or in the sort of void space of the eternal. So, there you go with the infinity. And the title screen closed with a shot of an eye, the eye of the void. Again, maybe referencing Da'ath to those who are in the know. So the ay, ayin in Hebrew means the no thing, the nothing, which Kabbalists used to point to God 
as the ineffable. Okay, so that's Lena and that's Mal, her friend. And they are just normal kids at first. Um, I think they're orphans, which is a common theme again in Hollywood. Maybe relating to the orphan trains and mud floods, which is a whole other chapter topic. So they just want to be normal teenagers, but they get swept up into this plot because she's a she's got magic. She's a rare one. Rare. She has rare uh, magical abilities. Certain gifts like tel telepathy, telekinesis, etc. This is a world where this, what they call the fold, sort of a black hole abyss, was opened up as a result of magic gone wrong. And it separates two lands, and she ends up having to uh, travel across through the abyss on this ship where we see the double crested bird symbol which connects to the two bulls two birds same same thing dualism and the specific animal powers animal human duality element there as well the second episode title screen looked to me like maybe menstrual blood which ties into this Da'ath code again. If you are confused, read read my recent blog post. That's General Kurigan. He's the villain of season one. He's after Alina's... Well, he wants to control her and use her powers. She can summon the sun. She's a sun summoner. Like Christ, kind of sounding like she's being cast in the Christ role here. So in this scene, we have a definite uh, ritual illumination, MK Ultra type uh, programming going on, where she's being illumined through ritual astronomy. Uh, he's her handler, programmer, common element you'll see. So he uh, scrapes her skin, and uh, as the sun summoner, light is light shines forth, uh, placing her as, oh well, it's the kundalini awakening as well, shattering in the brain before it should, before it should be, the pineal gland, uh, she becomes one of the illuminati, the illuminated ones. Third episode, we see a uh, title screen, we have the bird, the bird always typifies Christ again, uh, the soul and its flight back to heaven. This is the crow, which is black, because the soul comes down to matter and becomes burnt or marred as a result of flesh existence. Again, a Christ animal symbol, animal totemism. Now this is a funny scene. We have this group traveling through the fold in a ship and it's very dangerous in the fold because there's demons. Again, this is universe B through Da'ath, if you're a Kabbalist. And how do they... So, he he brings along a goat. The only reason... There's no real practical purpose as they're prepping for this trip through the dangerous fold. When the guy says, okay, we'll need a goat. And they never explain why the goat turns out just for emotional support, support animal keep this guy calm. So we have the goat, and the goat's name is Milo, which struck me as it's the same name as the dog in the mask, Milo, equaling 23, as I just, the only reason I know that is because of, uh, Jesse pointed that out, and, uh, of course, this ties into the serious code with the dogs in every single Jim Carrey movie. The other dog being Ned, also 23, just like the movie was the number 23. Okay, 
and I just can't help but when I think about goats, how on 9-11 it was my pet goat that George Bush was reading to the kids, and of course the goat being Pan or Satan, but in this case we have sacrificial goats, right, sacrificing to Satan or to the dark forces, if you will. Now, in this scene, we have the villain handler, Kirigan, and I noticed that he picks up a bundle of sticks, which is a faggot, okay, that's what the word means, and he's, uh, so he's showing basically what he is. Most of these Illuminati agents are homosexual, just the nature of how they roll. Okay, I'm not saying that to bash on gays, it's just a fact that uh, a lot of these, because they, they groom homosexuals and, ba and blackmail them as, as to, you know, to keep them in line, otherwise they'll reveal to the world that uh, the, their, their sexual preference and so forth. But it's just interesting here, because he, since he's our handler and we're talking about ritual sodomy, there's an element here of, well, yes, faggot. Okay, next we have the stag. It is sort of this mythical beast in the show, and they are aware of this certain beast as imparting uh, special superhuman powers, just like Crowley was on to. And uh, so they want to kill this stag and grind up his bones and use him to enhance their powers. At least that's what this Kerrigan guy wants to do. And Kerrigan is again working with Alina, trying to keep her and her powers in his control. And so what he does is he does indeed kill the stag and he takes the antlers and he's attempting a ritual of uh, joining the antlers to her physical body and again we have to keep all this in the lens of MK Ultra programming and the kind of rituals they do in the in the SRA circles so there she goes now she has horns attached to her, and uh, now she can access the powers of the stag. Okay, so stag, an ungulate, an angel. Okay, so now we have fallen angel symbolism, and we have, again, accessing superhuman atavistic animal powers, as was practiced by the ancients, ancient shamans and adepts, etc. Now the whole point of this black and white duality symbolism is that you, you can do this for good, you can access the animal powers through the portal of Doth and actually communicate with higher beings and bring back intelligence. This is the basis of all, uh, well let's say inspired or channeled material, authentically speaking. But if the adept or initiate attempts these rituals uh, for ill uses, then he, it will backfire on him and he will become uh, the animal. He will lose his humanity in the process. Which happened again to Kirigan and created this fold in the first place. <laughs> 